Thank you for coming out. Thank you for your patience with parking and with our parking lot being paved. Uh, it's gonna look great. Um, also, for those of you live streaming from elsewhere, welcome to our new and improved live streaming setup, courtesy of the inimitable Rob Milligan back there. Um, so those of you here in person, you should go home and watch the, watch the recording because it's gonna be really good. He like upgraded it, it looks so cool. Um, my name is Jesse Rack. I am the program director here. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanna make a couple of announcements. So the restrooms and water fountains are on the other side of that wall. To get there, you have to kind of go that way and around and keep turning right. Um, also, I'd like to remind you that we are a 501c nonprofit and we exist because of your support. Uh, if you like what you're seeing tonight and the other workshops and opportunities we offer, help us keep doing it, please. Uh, we help us keep the lights on. We also accept donations of nature items for our table, as Christina knows. <laughs> so whatever you can do to help helps us out a lot. Um, finally, a couple of upcoming events you might be interested in. Uh, first up, we have a couple of webinars next month, if you're into that lifestyle. Um, on Wednesday, April 12th, I'm very excited about this, we are hosting an online-only webinar conversation with the philosopher, nature writer, and activist Kathleen Dean Moore um, to kick off our new series, which is called Healing the Earth, Healing Ourselves. That'll go April through June. I have a flyer. I'm going to Vanna White it for you. And so this is called, thank you, thank you. So this is called Gratitude is a Way of Life. So a webinar with Kathleen Dean Moore. Um, also, on Wednesday, April 19th, we're wrapping up our Science in Conversation webinar series uh, with uh, a, a talk, or sorry, a conversation called Saving Nature in the Heat Age, A Natural History of Climate Change. Um, this is by Mark Urban. He's an award-winning scientist and global expert on climate change impacts on nature probably most famous for being my PhD advisor, so <laughs> ask anyone. <laughs> also online only, here's the flyer for that. Thank you, thank you. There it is, <laughs> Mark Urban. Thank you, oh my gosh. Um, and finally, our current gallery exhibit, which maybe you got a chance to check out ahead of time, The Art of Natural History, that will be open until mid-April. I think it closes April 14th, so make sure you get a chance to go in and check it out. It's very cool. Um, and if you haven't already seen it, it'll be open after the talk for you to check out then. So, the other side. Finally, it is my immense pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeb Bevers. Uh, so Dr. Bevers teaches biology courses and mentors undergraduate research just up the street at Yavapai College. Uh, he received a master's degree in biology from Portland State University, where he researched the biogeography of Tasmanian mammals. Uh, for his doctoral research, he focused on the microevolution and recolonization of pikas, which if you don't know what these things are, they're these adorable furry potato mammals. You know, everyone's <laughs> nodding, that live on the top of mountains. They have uh, a really high Bambi factor. They, they're so cute. Um, yes. Anyway, so pikas on the volcanically impacted landscape of Mount St. Helens in Washington State. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the pikas on Mount St. Helens talk also. So. Um, in 2011, Dr. Bevers instructed a course in ecology, conservation, and interactive educational outreach to grade schools in Paraguay under a Fulbright grant. Um, his current research areas include fossil surveys and a small museum collection from three neogene terrestrial sites in Arizona and 19th century biology and paleontology. So tonight you're gonna to be hearing the results of some of his sabbatical activities in 2022, which included research on Alfred Was Russell Wallace's annotated book collection held at the Linnaean Society of London and at the Center for Research Collections at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so in summary, Dr. Bevers has studied everything from mammals to paleontology and the history of science. Uh, we're delighted he's here with us uh, tonight to share a small corner of what he knows. So with that, I give you Dr. Jeb Bevers and his talk, Between Wallace's Lines. Thank you. And uh, thank you for arriving to help celebrate uh, Wallace's bicentenary year. He was born in 1823 on January 9th, and uh, there he is. Probably the most important implement he had for collecting was this. Not, this is not Wallace's, obviously, but <laughs> Annette. Uh, he ended up collecting 110,000 insects uh, in eight years in the Malay Archipelago. Not him 
himself, but he had a few assistants, but he did grab a number of them. So let's start. I'm afraid the ship's on fire, Mr. Wallace, Captain Turner told Wallace while he was relatively bedridden, had been ill with fever for several days on board the Helen, and they were about halfway home across the Atlantic. After some attempts to uh, put out the fire, they were ordered to abandon the ship. And what happened is uh, Wallace uh, grabbed a few of his sketches and uh, papers, but not much else, and made his way blurrily in a feverish state over to the ropes and slid down the ropes, uh, slashing a lot of his hands on the way down. But regardless of that, uh, he had to bail because the lifeboats had been drying out in the tropical sun as they traversed across the Atlantic and they were seething in water. Everyone had to bail to keep afloat. It took a while before the wood engorged and they could stop doing that. He indicates to a friend of his, Richard Spruce, or a botanist in the Amazon, I began to think that almost all the reward of my four years of privation and danger were lost. He lost much of his collection that went down with the ship. And they tried to get towards the Bahamas. The winds weren't with them. They weren't getting very far, and they were nearly out of water when another ship, the Jordison, came by and they were rescued by uh, Captain Venables, their crew joining with the Jordison's crew and heading back to England. They were running really short on supplies, but they did make it back. The worst part were just the storms. Again, they almost didn't make it back due to two severe storms and in one gale storm uh, where Wallace and Captain Turner were sharing Venables' uh, cabin. He noted that uh, the captain had an ax by his hand in the chair he was sleeping in and he asked him, what was going on. He said, if, if we capsize, I'm going to chop the mast down. Wallace in his life wrote 22 books. Over 700 articles were published by Wallace and in a wide range of topics. Uh, being a biologist and a bit of a field biologist myself, he is known for sciences, but he also dwelled into anthropology, socialism, spiritualism, and even a book on or two on exobiology. He's most no well noted for his independent concept of the mechanism for evolutionary uh, change. And he didn't refer to it as natural selection, but it became known as the uh, Darwin-Wallace theory of natural selection. And he was highly regarded throughout his life. How did he do all of this? He came from a relatively modest family background. His, Family would be what you would call lower middle class. His father, Thomas, had been trained as a lawyer, but he never practiced. And instead, he uh, relied upon his modest inheritance, which kept dwindling further and further down. And he did odd jobs along the way. Um, Wallace was able to attend grammar school, but at the age of 13, due to a lack of family funds, he had to leave school. And at that point in time, his uh, parents suggested that he'd better go apprentice with his eldest brother. So John and Alfred went to William and began a surveying trade for several years around parts of England and Wales. And Wallace also took up during this time. He, he had always enjoyed nature and the outdoors, but he really took up uh, botanical habits, collecting plants, identifying plants. He purchased one of his first guides to plants and then was upset to know that they didn't have a lot of scientific information on it, so he borrowed another book and wrote lots of annotations in this book. He was also influenced by an early socialist, uh, Richard Owen, who founded a lot of the English movement in this area, and Wallace forever afterwards was quite pro-socialist in terms of how we should uh, support the common person. We should educate them, we should make it uh, such that people are not uh, hurting so much and that they have the means to uh, work and supply themselves. He was able to, after uh, a few years working as a surveyor, he got a job at, uh, he also discovered geology, and uh, he noted uh, that it was amazing. 
he had never had an exposure to this field, but he just took a big interest in that. He started widening his interests. He read Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, which had been out in the 1830s, and he read a lot of things in public libraries. Uh, he couldn't afford much of his own personal books at this time, and I would advocate that we should all support public libraries. After the surveying position, he got a position as a schoolmaster uh, teaching, or as a teacher at the Leicester Collegiate School, teaching, surveying, and drawing. And uh, the schoolmaster actually trained him a little bit more in algebra. And he also met someone who was quite important for the rest of uh, his turn of life, and that was Henry Walter Bates, another young person at that time. And Bates had actually published a couple of papers on beetles in the local zoologist. And Wallace was fascinated to learn from Bates that within 10 miles of Leicester, you could locate a 1,000 species of beetles. And he quickly became a beetle enthusiast, got all the collecting gear, went out, and he and Bates would compare what they found. And they exchanged not only beetles and notes, but lots of other ideas. And their imagination just expanded and expanded further. Uh, one of the books that Wallace and Bates had read, and many people read at that time, was The uh, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, anonymously written by Robert Chambers, who indicated that species did change over time. He didn't actually come up with a scientific method for this, but he was putting it out. It was a popularly read work, and it influenced Wallace's thoughts. But this concept of change or transmutation was becoming in the air, so to speak. Uh, a few other people had come up with the idea, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, in his theory of acquired characteristics, which had some play in France and less in England. But they also read narratives of travel, like Alexander von Humboldt's uh, Travels in South America, which gave them the idea that we should go down and we should try and collect and publish. He had a short trip, his first trip overseas to France, and uh, visited his sister, Fanny, who was teaching over there. And he notes in 1847 to Henry Walter Bates that I should like to take some one family to study thoroughly, principally with the view to the theory of the origin of species. So this was something that he was really thinking about in the 1840s. They had to make connections, so they did so. And a local author, actually an American who happened to be in England, William Edwards, and they had just read his book, A Voyage Up the Amazon. They talked to Edwards about how he did this. He had uh, basically supported his travels through selling of insects. He had 13 different contracts to wealthy collectors that he shipped them back to, and they thought, we can do this too. And they went and talked to the curator at the British Museum, who suggested work in the northern Amazon. It's not very well surveyed. And so more exotic, less surveyed, more exciting, perhaps better funds for the collections. They received a letter of support from the uh, botanist Sir William Hooker, curator of the Kew Gardens, which Wallace did collect for a little bit. They also got a connection with Samuel Stevens, and Stevens acted as their agent throughout their collecting career for selling the collections to museums and to private collectors. And he also helped them publish some of their papers. He was a member of the Entomological Society and Zoological Society. And there's their auction house. So they went off to the Amazon, and uh, it took a month getting there in 1848. They set up near the uh, at first, they arrived near Para in the lower Amazon, and after a few days of uh, looking around there and getting excited, and then finding that you're not going to find a lot of new things where many people are settled, they went up river a ways, hiring a few locals, and they set up this routine for months. This is what they were doing. In the morning, they were out birding, which means searching for the birds and shooting the birds. In the afternoons, when it was hot, they were out grabbing the insects. And then 
often hit by a daily thunderstorm, you'd have to take cover, shelter, maybe make some notes, and in the evening, skinning, pinning, and preparing the specimens, and more notes, and having dinner and tea in conversation with the locals. And uh, Wallace noted some of the quotes that the locals made on their curiosity over them. Oh, the patience of the whites. Does he take all the meat out? <laughs> Look, he makes eyes of cotton. Wallace early on, and Bates as well, but uh, Wallace in particular, uh, relying upon locals, indigenous people in different locations and living with them, learning their language, learning a lot of cultural customs. He uh, admires this one person that they hired uh, of four men initially, Isadora, because not only was he a fine cook, but he also had lots of relevant information that he could relay on where they should go, who they should work with. The first shipment they sent back to Stevens included 1,300 species in total, lots of butterflies, moths, beetles, other insects, and a dozen containers of palms and ferns to Hooker. And there's a few samples of Bates' collection uh, and localities as to where he obtained them. They split up within a year, they split up, then almost certainly they split up just because it would reduce their competition with each other. And so they would also go in separate areas. Occasionally they rejoined and discussed what was going on, noting things. They remained friends throughout their life. Bates spends 11 years in the Amazon. And he comes up, he writes a, quite a few works on the Amazon, but he comes up with the concept in biology of Batesian mimicry, how certain species cryptically begin to look like others. Wallace, a few years later, came up with a reason for this through natural selection is that uh, they're using warning coloration and adapting and avoiding predators because of that warning coloration. They may not be toxic themselves, but the predators don't know this. There's one of Bates' journal pages. There are a lot of things you have to deal with in the tropics in South America. And uh, all of them faced periods of severe illness, lots of fevers, other maladies, Wallace several times didn't know if he was going to survive. And remarkably, he did, because many people did not. He was bitten by a number of things. Every night, in many areas, he had to pull out the little chigos under his toes because they were drying out his blood and then laying eggs, and he, you got to get rid of them. And he found out soon that if you don't cover every inch of skin in certain areas, you are going to have vampire bat bites. His brother, his youngest brother, Henry comes out and uh, decides he's going to take up some collecting with Wallace. They spend about a year traveling together in part of the lower Rio Negro and uh, Amazon area there. But Henry decides that this is not for him. He doesn't have the enthusiasm that Wallace has. And so Wallace says, OK, uh, why don't you go home? He's going down to Para uh, to collect for a few more months and then go home. Unfortunately, an outbreak of yellow fever hits and Henry comes down with it and dies. In the last few days of his life, uh, Henry Walter Bates actually nursed uh, Henry. Wallace himself is quite ill one time and he hears, overhears the locals saying, what are they going to do? You know, who's going to get what of his objects when he dies? Because that's what they think is gonna happen to him. And he vows at that time that he will never travel in remote areas without someone else that he can trust. He sketched, he did not collect, but he sketched hundreds of different fishes. And uh, this particular sketch of this freshwater stingray, Potomota trigon, Wallaceae, was recently described and named only in 2016. And it matched, actual specimens matched his sketch. Here's a couple other of his sketches. And Wallace states, there is no part of natural history more interesting or instructive than the study of the geographical distribution of animals. This is an incredibly powerful drive on his mind as to why are they here? Why are they not here? Why are there different species? Why are some very similar, very close together? And why maybe not in some areas? The small fishes in the rivers of the Rio Vapes and Negro, he noticed that there was a huge variety and in different locations, in every small river and in different parts of the same river, distinct kinds are found. I found 205 species in the Rio Negro alone, which he estimated would be at most half of the species. And he urged strongly the Zoological Society 
to make more accurate geographical localities to answer many of the questions he was working on because he was very disturbed at some of the specimens he would see and they would say the Amazon or South America. Living with indigenous people really broadened his mind. And uh, I would also advocate, having done so myself, that if uh, you ever have the chance, hopefully you have, go live somewhere else. Because you'll find out that everyone wants to pretty much live a good life and, and work together. And it would be a very good thing. But he picked up lots of cultural aspects from them, and it removed a lot of his, uh, a lot of the Victorian prejudices that he might otherwise have held. In fact, you know, if, if you were to give him honorary degrees, he probably should have two or three doctorates in anthropology just for all of the things that he did. He did study the Amazonian palms on this side, and he named over a dozen of them. Five of these still retain his nomenclature. This uh, one here on the right is uh, Asai de Katinga in the local name, which he was writing down all the local names and of the local uses. And the fruit is used to make a drink. He noted that various palms were used for flooring, for thatching of the roofs, for wall support, for making blow gun darts, for making spears, for making boats, canoes, for foods, and even some of them you would open up and eat uh, the grubs out of. A couple of sketches of the Amazon. And he notes that there is, however, one natural feature of this country, the interest and grandeur of which may be fully appreciated in a single walk. It is the virgin forest. And Wallace had much greater opportunity to see that than we do. Here, no one who has any feeling for the magnificent and sublime can be disappointed by the enormous size and height of the trees. The influence of these giant trees influenced, I mean, that was another big part of his life, and you'll see that a bit later. He mapped out with the surveying skills an excellent cartography of the Rio Grande and the Wapis. And this was published by the Royal Geographical Society and, and also helped to establish him as a geographer. So he gets back after the shipwreck and uh, several years of collection are gone. He thinks that maybe he's going to be penniless. He doesn't know what he's going to do. Although just a few days after arriving, he's starting to uh, think about another expedition. And he finds out from his employer, Samuel Stevens, that he had insured the cargo and he gets 200 pounds which is enough for him to live in London for over a year. And uh, he also attends the Entomological and Zoological Society meetings. He publishes a few papers there. He keeps busy. He publishes two books in this year. And uh, they are the narrative of travels on the Amazon and Rio Negro and palm trees of the Amazon and their uses. Hooker reviews the palm trees. Of course, he's a botanist and he says it's, it's not really worth much because it is not a botanical text. It's not something that a botanist would really want. But, you know, Wallace lost years of journal material. He had to rely upon memory, a few notes, and letters that he sent home, and some sketches. But both of these highlight a lot of cultural uses, and, and Hooker did indicate that it does have some useful applications of the palms by local people. And Sandy Knapp, who is a botanist of the Natural History Museum, stated that this book, although not a professional text, really is a version of what you would call a popular guide. And in this respect, Wallace was just about 100 years ahead of his time, because no one is writing popular guides of natural history at this time. Wallace obtained funds from the Geographical Society and support for him and an assistant, to Charles Allen, to go to Singapore and begin his next expedition. So he continues working with Stevens. And here's where they travel. There's in Singapore. They go over into the Malacca's here, Makassar into uh, Borneo and Sarawak for a year plus, then back 
and down and up and down following coastal routes, following the seasonal changes in tides and winds, over 16,000 miles of traveling in eight years. In those eight years, he and his assistants, mostly Charles Allen and Ali, a young Malaysian that he uh, hires on, they collect 126,000 specimens shipped over to uh, Samuel Stevens. Majority of those are insects. <laughs> Although 8,000 birds, estimated by some biographers, half of which were collected by Ali and a number of other people, uh, a few mammals, reptiles, and 7,500 gastropods. Of these, only a small percentage has ma have made it into public institutions and museums. Of the insects, 7%. Yet the British Museum or the Natural History Museum today, 12% of the birds, and at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, just under 5% of the insects. What happened to most of them? Well, they were sold by Stevens to private collectors. And a, a good fraction were also taken by Wallace for his own personal studies, of which he was able to apply to several books and uh, many papers. But later on, when he wasn't financially doing well, he sold much of that. Other collectors, such as Saunders, when their estate went under, and they had vast numbers of these collections, most of them just disappeared. And some of them made it their way back into museums, but without any of the contextual information. So most of these, we don't know where they are today. Of those specimens that were sent back, what is known and what has been published is 5,000 species, new to science. Wallace named over 300 of those. Other researchers published 4,700 species and as you saw in 2016, there's still a few being added to this. At least 250 have Wallace's name, including the Sula Dwarf Kingfisher Sakes Wallacey. And that's taken from one of the books at the Linnean Society, uh, Sharp's uh, monograph of the Kingfishers. Here's another one that uh, Wallace uh, located in John Gould, the ornithologist at the British Museum, stated that uh, the giant kingfisher was, must be regarded as one of the finest of Mr. Wallace's discoveries. Wallace found it in the Aru Islands, but it's also known to be in New Guinea, nearby. Wallace did not collect this animal, but uh, he was uh, gifted this frog and had a description of how it uh, flew. And he observed it for himself and noted that the webbing of the frog were greatly expanded and it could parachute around. He wrote later, this I believe, the first instance known of a flying frog, and it is very interesting to Darwinians, as showing that the variability of the toes have been taken advantage of to enable a frog species to pass through the air like a flying lizard. A few of the insects. On the left is Raja Brooks, birdwing butterfly, which he named after his friend, Sir James uh, Brook who also governed over Sarawak at that time. It's now Malaysia's national butterfly. Uh, Wallace is actually quite well respected across uh, much of Malaysia and Indonesia. On the upper right is Wallace's golden birdwing butterfly. And uh, here's his description in the Malay archipelago of what he felt after taking it out. Upon taking it out of my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart began to beat violently, the blood rushed to my head, and I felt much more like fainting than I have done when in apprehension of immediate death. And if anyone knew about apprehension of immediate death several times over, it would probably have been Wallace. Another little beetle that he thoroughly enjoyed collecting and observing, he didn't just collect, he observed, he noted, he stated where they were, where they were located, where they were not located, what they were similar to. My finest discovery here in the Celebes was Cisandella gloriosa, which I found on mossy stones and just above the water. It was rather shy and would often lead me a long chase from stone to stone, becoming invisible every time it settled on the damp moss owing to its rich velvety green color, which also fits into adaptations and camouflage and certainly is one of the thoughts that was crossing Wallace's mind now and later. 
He found these very odd flies in Western New Guinea, the staghorn flies, Phytal Phytomia today, among the insects, the most curious and novel which were a group of horn flies of which I obtained four species. The horns spring from beneath the eye and seem to be a prolongation of the lower part of the orbit. And they're only found in the males, sexual selection, which Darwin and Wallace uh, kind of debated back and forth, and Wallace eventually accepted most of sexual selection. Of Wallace's animal collections, those that have received the fewest number in museums are the gastropods. And there was a paper in 2015 highlighting that the National Museum of Wales held 12, likely, 12 of Wallace's specimens. The Exeter Museum holds five. I found an 1865 paper before I went over to uh, London, and I wrote uh, the curator, John Ablett, about Wallace's shells and whether I might look at some examples. And he said, I don't think we have any, but you can certainly look at some, some types that we have out there. So I went out and I began looking through a series of specimens and the third, fourth, and fifth species that I was looking at. And I was only looking at types that Wallace mentioned and localities that he had uh, collected on. I started to find evidence that Wallace had collected there. And John got pretty excited. I was getting excited. John's been doing a lot of work finding additional specimens. And if we go back, uh, now he has about 100 specimens that Wallace has collected, which is the most that anyone is aware of, and makes a uh, total, all these, 1.56% of all of Wallace's mollusks. Here's the 1865 paper in the plate that shows some of the new species. Examples of uh, Wallace's shells to Stevens in three Gaililo shipments. There's the Isle of Gaililo. And Bajian shipments uh, included 88 helix from Gaililo. Also, Gaililo shells were sent in the Ternati and Minado shipment of 1859 and from Mysol and Waigu over in New Guinea. Wallace obtained about 850 land shells and 1,300 uh, marine shells for his own private use, yeah. but we have no idea as to where a single marine mollusk was that Wallace had collected. But we do know some of the uh, terrestrial shells now. So here's a few that John has located, and I've put in localities based upon biographical information and likely collecting dates for them. And here's a Another one, which he indicates that his assistant, Mr. Allen, collected here because he was not in Sula Island. So this one was collected through Wallace, but not by Wallace. And he went to the Sula Islands and made a very interesting collection, which served to determine the limits of the zoological group of the Celebes. He was always interested in those geographic limits and restrictions. And why are they so? In his 1865 paper, Wallace noted that the shells, land shells, divide the Australian fauna with the Asian fauna, just like many of the birds, many of the mammals, and many of the insects that he was looking at. There's a big demarcation there. The restricted range so characteristic of land shells is well shown by my collection, no less than 90 species of the 125 being confined to a single island. He wasn't always happy with his assistants. And uh, one of these, uh, Charles Allen, he had a little trouble with. He wrote to his sister about a potential replacement, stating, after 12 months of constant practice and constant teaching, and not the slightest sign of improvement regarding Allen's poor skill in taxidermy and in uh, pinning of insects. Uh, the wings were never straight. They were always folded and crumpled over. But he did say that he collects uh, very well. So. Allen did retain, was retained by Wallace, but uh, he ended up relying upon Ali. And this is the only known photo of Ali, his young Malaysian assistant, who served with Wallace for about five to six years of his eight years in the Malay archipelago. And half the birds, many biographers now 
biographers, some biographers think that half the birds were collected by uh, Ali of the 8,000. Uh, living with the locals in northern Borneo and in Sarawak, he slept com comfortably with half a dozen smoke-dried hung heads suspended over my head. And Wallace again notes the culture, the artifacts they're using, the religions they have, the economic system, and he collects, he does collect several orangutans, something that would not be uh, favored today, but He's also the first person to write detailed observations on their habits and behaviors. And he actually uh, raises one for a few months. One morning in his uh, hut in Amboina, in the Moluccas, he uh, notes something odd up in the thatch. And he hears this noise and he goes outside and there's a giant python. It's about 12 feet or so in length. And he alerts Ollie and another assistant, and they look at it and they flee off, but they get some locals, bring it back, and they assist in taking the python. And here in the Malay archipelago is the uh, scene of them grabbing the python, and there's the skin now housed at the Linnean Society in London. In a letter to uh, Stevens, he's indicating more geographic interests in the birds and how they're sorting out uh, the, their distribution in the east and the west. The islands of Bali and Lombok, though of nearly the same size, of the same soil aspect, elevation and climate, and within sight of each other, yet differ considerably in their productions, and in fact belong to two quite distinct zoological provinces of which they form the extreme limit. In Lombok, we have the limit of the Australian fauna, and in Bali, the easternmost extent of the Asian fauna. And uh, through there and through the Celebes in Borneo lies what is referred to as Wallace's line. I'm now sending off to Singapore a case of my collections. And uh, for us, the most important is the freshwater snails and land snails. And a domestic duck is for Mr. Darwin, who had written to him. Darwin didn't really know much about Wallace other than he's a collector out in the exotic lands. And if he would favor him, a couple of specimens. Darwin writes back to him after a few conversations, one of the subjects on which I have been experimenting and which cost me much trouble is the means of distribution of all organic beings found on oceanic islands. And any facts on this subject would be most gratefully received. Land mollusks are a great perplexity to me. There's Darwin's house, now a English heritage site. Two of my friends are there. And in another letter from Darwin later, he wrote this book referred to as the Sarawak Law, which uh, on the law which has regulated the introduction of new species, 1855. And he states twice in there, in italics, every species has come into existence coincident both in time and space with a pre-existing closely allied species. This is hitting pretty close to Darwin's own thoughts which he's been sitting on for nearly two decades. And Darwin writes back, I am extremely glad to hear that you are attending to distribution in accordance with the theoretical ideas. I am a firm believer that without speculation, there is no good in original observation. So very few naturalists care for anything beyond the mere description of species. But you must not suppose that your paper has not been attended to. Two very good men, Sir Charles Lyell and Mr. E. Blythe of Calcutta specifically called my attention to it. Close colleagues of Darwin's and well-respected scientists. And uh, Wallace was pretty excited about this because Samuel Stevens had actually wrote to him about this paper and said that uh, other, uh, some other people said, stop theorizing and just start collecting more. It was one of the places he lived at and uh, a little side trip here on his voyage from Saram up to uh, northern New Guinea and Waigu here. He made a couple of stops. He was desperately trying to rendezvous with Charles Allen, who was out there. The winds kept pushing them away. They never were able to make it there. And no matter what happened, they lost an anchor at one point. They were down to one anchor, and they were really worried that they might lose that. 
they also nearly died of thirst, running out of water, and they stopped on this little islet, and Wallace, after two days, uh, finally found a muddy pool and got water for them. Two men became stranded when the winds were blowing them away and they couldn't get back. So after getting to Waigu, several weeks later, they went back and rescued those guys. And then, a little later, in 1858, early 1858, Wallace comes in and out of a delirium while Ollie is attending to him in his hut and uh, considers his observations on distinct forms, on different islands. He notes the variations in populations and then hits upon Malthus's argument for competition for limited resources in humans that he read 13 years before and considers and applies this to all animals. And then it hits him, vaguely thinking over the enormous and constant destruction of many individuals, it occurred to me, why do some die and some live? And the answer was clearly that on the whole, the best fitted live. And so he comes up with a very parallel concept to Darwin's and history would be completely different if he had not written this paper and sent it off to Mr. Charles Darwin yeah. and asking a favor if he might uh, consider that perhaps Charles Lyell would uh, think highly of that paper and perhaps you might publish it. If he had sent it off only to a journal, it would not, you know, Darwin still has done a lot of work, but it wouldn't be natural selection connected just with Darwin so much as it is today. And it wasn't then. This was jointly published. Darwin fretted about this, didn't know what to do, and then his friends, uh, Hooker and Lyell, convinced him that they should jointly publish because they really had been working on this parallel concept for a long time. And so they did jointly publish in the Linnaean Society in 1858 on July 1st. Neither were in attendance. Wallace was a few thousand miles away, and uh, Darwin was uh, mourning over their two-and-a-half-year-old uh, son who had just died. I sent, and... Uh, he, he finds out months later, and Wallace is so excited. I sent Miss, he writes to his mother, I sent Mr. Darwin an essay on a subject in which he is now writing a great book. He showed it to Dr. Hooker and Sir Lyell, who thought so highly of that that they immediately read it before the Linnaean Society. And it was kind of a rush job to put it in, but they did do it, and, and it was for many decades known as the Darwin-Wallace theory, which it should still be known as today. Now a little interlude back into the big trees. As I mentioned, Darwin, or Wallace, had a uh, big interest in these majestic uh, creatures. And here's a book, Recollections of a Happy Life, Marianne North, who is a wonderful botanical artist. And uh, he read through her book volumes and noted in particular um, in Australia big trees. And here he just uh, highlighted part of the text where she wrote and noted, a woodman told me that he had often felled trees over 400 feet high. The highest the baron measured was 365 feet and I painted that very tree, a white gum. There are over 300 of those giant trees and there's Marianne's uh, illustration in Tasmania. They measured the circumference of one tree at 76 feet around. Although she states it was a most difficult thing to get accurate truth about those trees, they always melted away as we came near them. Though, don't mess with a biogeographer. And uh, in her book, she wrote in South Africa and noted the toucans, which uh, Wallace crossed out and wrote hornbills. Another example of the big trees in Victoria. I spent four delightful hours sketching and resting under those gigantic white pillars, which were far more imposing than the trees of Burnshaw. And now Wallace's final expedition. Later in life, in 1886, he uh, goes to North America and is invited by the Lowell Institute to, to present lectures on Darwinism, on natural history. And he accepts, he's a little hesitant, but accepts because financially it might be a good thing. And he can also observe the natural history in the US and visit his brother John, who he hasn't seen in 40 years. He's able to get out to California after successful talks in uh, the East 
and in Colorado because John sets up some lectures for him. And he notes that uh, although the science lectures are well attended, when he gave a couple of lectures in spiritualism, which he became an enthusiast over because of his sister Fanny, who introduced him into that, that he sometimes had much larger crowds and therefore more financial gain from those. Although the last spiritualism talk he gave, he wrote down in the journal that he wasn't very happy with it because after all the expenses of renting the hall, uh, I think he and his brother had $1.50 left over. They also visited the big trees. He told his brother that's what he wanted to see. And so he went with a Dr. Gibbons and a Mr. John Muir to look at uh, some of the redwoods in Alameda and spent an afternoon eating lunch and dining around uh, some of the giant redwoods. Whoops. Many of them already harvested, but uh, noting some great younger trees around side, a 34-foot uh, diameter stump they ate within. We don't know what was discussed here, but one of the influences is that Muir likely went to the Amazon later in his life because of Wallace's discussions and correspondence with him. And it's possible that Wallace also influenced Muir to advocate for even greater conservation and establishment of sites for trees. He wasn't a fan of the hot weather. He also went with his uh, brother and niece into Yosemite, examined the valley for several days. He had purchased in San Francisco this book, California Flora. There's his signature. And uh, used it extensively throughout his trip in California, noting all of the plants that he located and noted these specific little locations, such as uh, Big Trees, Sierra, Meadows of Big Trees, Stanislaw River, Big Trees, Nevada Falls, Yosemite, very fine. Small, very pretty, big trees. <laughs> a few other notes on uh, June 11th, when he was uh, exploring around Muir Lake and uh, Priest Valley, which he also wrote an article on, at least one, and I, he might have written more on it, but uh, one that I've read, he describes it as one of the most beautiful in the world. He stayed at the Calaveras Hotel and hiked sometimes uh, out uh, six miles one direction to look at the groves of big trees and measured all the groves. And he stated in several articles that of all the natural wonders I saw in America, nothing impressed me so much as these glorious trees. The huge decayed trunk called the father of the forest, which has fallen perhaps a century or more, exhibits the grandest dimension of any known tree. By measuring its remains and allowing for the probable thickness of the bark, it seems to have been around 35 feet diameter near the ground, 90 feet up, 15 feet, and even at the height of 270 feet, it was nine feet in diameter. It was in all probability more than 400 feet in height, which may or may not be a big tree, big fish story, as we have none that size anymore, but there may have been. Unfortunately, these alone are within the power of man totally to destroy, as they already have been partially destroyed. And Wallace's note, let us hope that the progress of true education will so develop the love and admiration of nature, that the possession of these altogether unequaled trees will be looked upon as a trust for all future generations, and that care will be taken before it is too late, to preserve not only one or two small patches, but some more extensive tracts of forests, in which they may continue to flourish in their fullest perfection and beauty. Thanks to uh, Linnaean Society, Yavapai College, my friend Robert for reading a few thousand pages uh, along with me to find some notes, John Ablett, a few references. These are from uh, the annotations here are from three of the 320 or so books I examined at the Linnaean Society Library this last summer. I'll be looking at a few more in about 30 at the Edinburgh uh, Library. And those are those three annotated books. Questions?
So we're going to try something. Is this turned up too high? No, nope. we're not going to do that. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so if you don't mind repeating the question when someone asks it. So that That's fine. Yes. Yes. Any questions? Yes. Maybe I should give a talk on that. <laughs> um, no, not right now. But, uh, but I do want to go back to Australia at least once more, twice at least, perhaps, but yeah. Um, on a side note, I'm working with a friend who has a, an ecological tour company and, and I might actually co-lead a tour in New Guinea uh, in two years. I was there for two months uh, many years ago and he said that uh, yeah, you like me to go. Mm. <laughs> you can pay for it <laughs> and support the tour. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yes, Mark. You mentioned the walleye line separating what would be found in those species that are more on the southeast Asian side and others on the New Guinea and Australian side. Yes. It does, it does. And uh, Wallace, oh, uh, it's about uh, noting the distinction between Wallace's line and the Asian and Australian uh, fauna between the two sides, between Lombok and Bali and Celebes and Borneo and other localities. And Wallace noted uh, that the ocean was quite deep. In fact, he had a, quite a rough ride in I think a 30 mile trip from Bali to Lombok and it scared him quite a bit <laughs> in this small boat uh, going in rough seas, getting over to the next island. And there were some measurements and it, he also noted that it was quite deep between these and, and that those other locations from Lombok over to Australia, the depth wasn't quite as much. From Bali going back towards Asia wasn't quite so much and that they must have had, uh, there were a lot of ideas of big land bridges at that time in the 1800s. Wallace later dismissed those concepts, although he was an early adopter of it, but he dismissed it. And they considered maybe during the Ice Age that there might have been more connections, but these were much better connected, much more likely for organisms to disperse between the shallow waters than the deep waters. And he noted this over and over. And he wasn't the first to ever note distinctions between the islands, but he was the first to detail so many differences and establish uh, them all the way across the archipelago. Question? Yes. Um, this one. Uh, this one I, I obtained from uh, a compiled uh, listing of letters from the Malay archipelago. So it was basically a compilation of many different letters corresponding back and forth between Wallace and other individuals uh, in the eight years that he was in Malay archipelago. And that was one of the uh, letter excerpts. I believe that you can find a number of these online. There are several good Wallace online sites to examine. Uh, Wallace Online is one of those, but many of them do have a lot of correspondence and letters uh, from Wallace to other individuals. And, but that particular book, I don't know if it's in the library, but you could request it be ordered in the library, but it's, it's letters from the Malay archipelago. Yes, please. How many people set out to do things like this but just died in the process and we never heard of it? Well, um, <laughs> a, lot. a lot. And some of, them, some of them did publish materials before they perished, but um, there were several, I think, Dutch and uh, perhaps some German uh, explorers. Over in the Malay archipelago, how many perished? Um, it was noted by John Van Wyhe in uh, 
his annotated book of the Malay Archipelago that several people didn't survive where Wallace was. And other articles have indicated the same thing, uh, such as in the Amazon. And so Wallace was sick a lot. And there were times he had an infection in New Guinea and part of the time on his foot, and it got so bad that he literally had to drag himself out of the hut to the water and back. He couldn't walk on it for a couple of weeks, and then it was with crutches. And he, he, he just hated that, of course, because every day he was missing all the collections he could have made. And he got yeah, but, but when he was idle, then he thought more and he wrote more. And so uh, we did not suffer from his lack of collecting, which, you know, 126,000 specimens, what more can you do? Yeah. It's not hot or it's not mm -hmm. even sticky. And the minute you walk into that jungle, you are drenched. It's literally it's so hot. So as soon as you get out into the tropics, under the canopy, the humidity goes way up because you have transpiration from the plants, producing and raising all that humidity and making a lot of the local climate, which is a potential threat to the tropics now is the more we cut down on that rainforest, the more we affect the uh, climate, not just microclimate, but the larger climate, and it will become very difficult to reestablish a lot of that. Yeah. Did he ever make note of the uh, pink toed tarantulas? No, I don't. I never, I never have read of that anyway. Oh. But I haven't read everything of Wallace, 90 years of publication. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a question from the live stream for you. Yes. archives. Hmm. I don't know if you mean museum archives, because he went several times to the museums. He went to the British Museum and went around and, and asked what might, uh, you know, where should I go? Where should I collect? He talked to the Geographical Society, where might be the least explored area on the planet, and the Malay Archipelago happened to have been one of those. And the most remote part was the further east you went towards New Guinea, was the least explored, and he always wanted to go to those least explored areas. But he went and looked at all the museum collections, he talked with curators, and looked over the specimens, and Bates had two originally, and they were trying to figure out where is the greatest need of new taxa, of new specimens? Where have people not been? And then again, Wallace uh, began to be quite upset about a lot of specimens with limited detail on their origins because that did not help him answer any of the questions. And I'm just going to grab this little book which uh, quotes some of the questions that he urged the Zoological Society to uh, work on in accurately determining the animal's range. Many interesting questions depend. Are very closely allied species ever separated by a wide interval of country? What physical features determine the boundaries of species? and of genera. Do the isothermal lines ever accurately bound the range of species or are they altogether independent of them? What are the circumstances which render certain rivers and certain mountain ranges the limits of numerous species while others not? And additional questions. Without this good geographic information, the context of the specimens that we have in collections here and elsewhere are pretty much valueless. And with that context, and if they are taken care of, they're great natural history libraries of which many generations from now can still be working on and still answer these and other questions. To clarify, I think her, her question is a little bit more about you gathering information. Me you gathering? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, for the annotations, I went through a listing. Uh, Will Biharo of the uh, Linnaean Society Library assisted in how I would uh, do a search for this, and then I did, I think, five different searches, overlapped them, started eliminating copied books, and then put together my list, then I organized my list. I think I had about 360 books to work through, of which I've got 320 or so, 330 that I've finished. And as uh, my friend Robert, who assisted for a few days on this, uh, uh, we described this research as being a real page turner. You're going through. And the other thing is, 
sometimes you have uh, lots of annotations in the end pages where Wallace is making lots of notes and that's really great. But otherwise, maybe you go through 286, oh, there's a note. Maybe 30 or 40 pages later, there's another note. Some, some books uh, like uh, Humboldt's two volume set on travels, it, it took about half the day because he had uh, hundreds of pages of notes on it. And I have photos of every single page. I have uh, over 4,000 photos of these various books and notations on those as well. So that's how I did that part. Yeah. Humboldt's book, yes. Um, like, are there other scientists or explorers that also have made annotations? Is oh, yes. Like yes. Book, yeah. Else? Yes, there are. Uh, Darwin is noted for making annotations in several books, and biographers have noted some of Darwin's uh, notations. Uh, several people have, biographers have looked at some of Wallace's notations, but I'm I've been the most comprehensive, as far as I know, and as far as uh, Will, the chief librarian, knows, uh, in terms of looking at the annotations in the library in the Linnaean, Linnaean Society. But yeah, um, it's I've done a bit of fossil surveying and locating, and uh, to me, it, it's kind of like another type of treasure hunt of looking for this valuable resource, and you just don't know where you'll find it. And just like a fossil survey, you have to cover a lot of territory to find useful information. I think it's that way with almost any research. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of time. But it's, I don't know, I, I just don't stop. I'm pretty excited about it. So I <laughs> just keep going. So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> hey. All right. I don't know where I'll go next, but. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm going back to uh, England, and afterwards I'm rendezvousing with my wife in Iceland. Yeah. Don't think I'll collect too many insects there, though. Yeah. Thank you for attending. <laughs>